Yeah. Okay, uh, so we restart in the new year. And uh, before we have our games, uh, let's uh, just talk about chess. So first, we're here to uh, start revolutions, change things, shake things up. That was never my intention, because I like to harmonize and accommodate people. Um, so uh, unfortunately, people have uh, stigmatized and persecuted me for my totally innocent ideas about playing G4 or openings like that. Uh, so I bear them no ill will. And of course, they are mistaken because G4, as we know, is the opening of the future. But let's talk about a, a different subject. Um, this is the uh, Invisible Army. Now, we have a wonderful thing in our hands, wonderful piece of technology. Uh, it's electricity, and electricity can be used to destroy and to build. But we also have the creation of this uh, electricity, the internet. And now we can play chess on the internet with anyone in the world. And I can speak to you as well with a chess board. Now I'm going to try and use this technology, because I myself don't actually have a computer. I prefer to use my own mind rather than the computer, but I can see its uses. So the Invisible Army is going to allow people to improve their play. And basically, that's one of the reasons you're here. You're listening to me. Maybe you can pick up some tips on how to enjoy chess, but also how to win more games. Now, one of the great things about uh, this, uh, what we have on chess.com, um, and there's lead chess as well, though I prefer myself chess.com because I think the gradings are more realistic. Uh, one of the great things is after a game you play, you get an instant grade. Now, back in the day, when we got our grades, they came out every year. So your progress was at a slow snail's pace. And I just remember about uh, when I was 18 or 19, um, unawares, somehow I had floated up into the top three in England. Uh, because you don't every day look at your grade, but you can. Uh, on chess.com, you can get instant feedback. So I think we should make use of that instant feedback. Uh, the, now, the other thing is the misuse of this technology. Uh, unfortunately, people go on the internet and they watch Magnus Carlsen and his mates playing. And they're all playing at lightning speed, blitz, amazing displays of virtuosity. So what does the poor schmuck who's watching these guys playing think? He thinks, oh, I've got to play as much as um, quickly as them. Same as the kids who don't, uh, you know, I teach a lot of kids. And they don't need any uh, encouragement to play quickly. They make their decisions quickly. If you look at any junior game, after about 10 seconds, the board's cleared of all the pieces. <laughs> so, and, you know, the, the poor teacher is telling them, slow down, slow down. And, but they can't, they, they can't understand, why do I have to slow down? What, what is there to think about? Um, so this is one of the disadvantages of this internet, that people are in, encouraged to play very quickly. And again, by the example of the Grand Masters, who I have to say should know better as they have a responsibility to the young people of the world. They have made chess entertaining, that's great. But remember, there, there is another duty it's to teach people. So, so this is one of the planks of my invisible army, that is the, the chess players who will be playing on the internet and trying to improve. The first thing is, if if you want to improve, you're going to have to play at a longer time limit. Now, chess games often used to last four or seven hours. On the internet, that's unusual. 
So it's a compromise, I would say. If you want to improve, you play uh, half-hour games. Also, you should record your games. You can get lazy if you just let the computer record. Because once chess opens up again and the lockdown's over, you'll be playing in tournaments and you'll be expected records. So don't expect to uh, <laughs> that things will change. And you might have lost the ability to record or to use a pen and paper. So record the games. When you've only got five minutes left on, on, on the clock, then stop recording because one advantage is that the computer will be recording and then you can catch up with your recording. So this is the first thing. I'm inviting people to, to join my uh, Invisible Army and I'm saying, yes, 10 minute games, uh, Blitz games are okay, but they don't really teach you much. They only show you what you already know. They can be a diagnostic tool, but if you want to improve, then I think you've got to spend longer uh, because the, the grandmasters, they've been through the learning process and then they can play quickly. Uh, but for most people in the world, they have to learn these ideas. So therefore, that's the first principle. Uh, take longer, play half hour games. Now, the second thing uh, of the Invisible Army is... Um, the incentive, the aim to uh, improve your grade. So, if you're playing a game and getting uh, the feedback, say you play a couple of games a week, you can play more. Again, I don't advise you to play lots of games. Um, this, this, uh, it won't won't help. So, play say a couple of games a week, and. Let's, let's give yourself a target, say a target of improving by 20 points a week. Because say on chess.com, sometimes you can go up 100 points, but usually it kind of levels out and you're going up about 10 points when you win a game. So if you can get to improve 20 points a week, let's say you started at a grade of 1400, which is sort of an average club player standard. And if you were going up 20 points a week over a period of a year, which is 50 weeks, you can calculate that 20 times 50 is 1,000. So you would be up to 2,400, which uh, would be quite an achievement because that's about the level of the international master. Uh, but because you've got the possibility of getting this you know, instant feedback, it's certainly a target to aim at, and but nonetheless, it's not an unrealistic target. Let's say, face it, if you did achieve those thousand points, they would be hard won. You know, the, the guys you meet on the internet, there are thousands, millions of beginners coming on who don't know much, but they're also very good players. So to struggle up uh, the grading list will be a fantastic challenge. So I try to formalize that. Of course, these titles are not strictly official, but let's face it, there aren't any official titles now. There is no over the board chess going on. And therefore, chess is in, to some degrees been put on hold. But at the same time, we can use this period of uh, hibernation to actually really improve our play and to learn a lot about the game of chess. So what I've also instituted uh, is uh, different titles. And for each title, you would get a certificate because you'd sign up to the Invisible Army. How would you do so? Well, um, if you go to chess.com or contact us on chess.com, in a few days we will have officially the Invisible Army and all the details put up. Um, so they will come, but via chess.com, that's, sorry, not chess.com, Mike Basman Chess. That's the one. No, chess.com is not doing this. We're using chess.com because their service is also uh, free, I think, though you can pay for lots of things, but the actual playing, very generously, I think they and Lee Chess 
have allowed us to use their technology and we don't need to pay for it. Of course, they do like to sell us their lessons as well. But so we use use chess.com, but my invisible army is, as it were, taking advantage of that by kind of formalizing what they're already doing. Uh, so the so when you get to certain grading levels, you get a certificate and you will get posted to you also a trophy engraved with the title you've gained and um, and and of course your 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 new status. So the I've actually instituted twelve different levels. Yeah. Uh, so I'll read them out to you. We got 1650, top club player, 1800, county champion, 2000, regional champion, 2100, national master, 2200, candidate master. That's kind of candidate international master rather than national master. 2300 is the equivalent of FIDE master. FIDE being the in World International Body. I'm kind of mirroring their, those titles that they have, but uh, naturally I'm not actually claiming that they're 100% official titles, but I do think they are genuine titles. If you achieve these levels, that is an achievement because, the, as I say, these, the chess is very strong on, uh, on the internet. So then you get up to 2400, that's International Master, which is my rank. Well, that's my rank, though it's not the grade I'm at at the moment. I'm more like 2100. Uh, 2500, you've got Arch Master. 2600, you have uh, Uber Master. And then 2700, Grand Master. And 2800, Super Grand Master. 2900, Universal. Now, in some ways, my uh, grading list is an improvement on the existing fee day list because what happens is you get to grade, you know, Grandmaster 2500, and there's nothing after that until you maybe get to become world champion, which is was which was the problem that Tony Miles had. Could have been the cause of his early death. It's very unusual for chess players to die young, uh, but uh, for some reason Tony did, who, who was a good friend of mine. But when he um, when he got the Grandmaster title, they said, what are you going to do now? And he said, well, I'll have a crack at the world title. What else is there? Yeah. But then, you know, if he had had all these other levels of Archmaster, Super Grandmaster, Universal, um, that would have been other things to aim for. Uh, Unfortunately, Tony didn't quite get to uh, the world championship level, but uh, one of his rivals, Nigel Short, did and um, challenged Kasparov in 1993. And even uh, John Spielman was very close. He got to a match with Jan Timon and, and lost that match. So that was kind of the high point of, of British chess, 1993, when short challenges Kasparov and uh, we now have lots of strong players which we have had for several years but nobody yet has actually got close to the title I think Michael Adams has got the closest uh, though he's never actually had a title uh, title bid maybe he will have in the future but uh, maybe not okay so if you want to join the invisible army um, then you contact us at chess.com, yeah, which is mikebasmanchess.com. Mike and someone says, Happy New Year, Mike. Okay, and it's, it, it is no so easy to go for 2400. That's true. I know that. That's true. Uh, it's not easy for me, mainly because I have a lot of teaching duties otherwise. I would obviously be able to take out Carlson. But let's let's not be daunted by a challenge. It's, it's not easy. And don't forget, there are lots of titles on the way, 1650, 1800. I'm also thinking of having a sort of cadet force to match the way you start at 800 as a beginner and then you get kind of certificates and trophies 
for getting up to 1,000 and 1,200 and so on. But so the, these uh, lower titles are certainly something you can aim for and should be in your grasp. But the other piece of advice is that you, you need to study. Just playing is not enough. So say one day you, you study something carefully, and we have a lot of books on, on uh, Mike Bowser's chess course. For example. And also the other thing I'll be doing is releasing a, a monthly newsletter where we will show everybody's grades and how they're improving and also giving tips on what, what to study in order to improve. So you need to make a balance. Any musician, any, chess, uh, any uh, tennis player, any footballer will practice before they a game. And you should not become a chess addict just going from one game to the next and not learning from it. So one day you, you study carefully and then take your progress seriously. Yeah. And the next day uh, you, you would play, play the game. Yeah. Uh, so that's, I, I welcome you to to the Invisible Chess Army, and I hope to be producing lots more Archmasters, and if not Archmasters, at least uh, people who've got to 2,000 grade of Regional Master. I'd like to also introduce you, before we have our chess games, to a, a remarkable chess teacher, uh, who you may vaguely have heard of, but um, I want to I, if I am I able to show this here, this picture, does that uh, evident now? Yes. So I wonder what you think this is. Uh -huh. What is this? What is it? <laughs> Last Supper is a very good description. It is, uh, it is an amazing picture and it was painted by a, some, I think, uh, Italian painter in, I think, 1886, Mussini. But it, it doesn't depict anything in 1886. It depicts something 300 years previous to that. And you can see there in the, uh, I think, the left of the picture, you have, uh, you have a chessboard and they're playing chess and then in the center there seems to be a very important person and there are some ladies and people going off towards the right. So what is this indeed? It's this incredible picture which is so true to life you almost think the person was there but no it's 300 years later. And what it is it's a match between uh, Rui Lopez who is seated on the far left. Uh, Rui Lopez, and um, he's playing uh, the Italian, who's standing up, I think, uh, De Coutry, the young, much uh, younger man. And uh, this was probably the first Grandmaster tournament, though there weren't Grandmasters then. And that was held uh, in the world, and it was under the auspices of the great king, King Philip the King Philip of Spain, the King Philip II, uh, known in England, of course, for his uh, failure to wipe us out uh, after he sent the Armada to us. But besides being a, a bit of a warlord, um, King Philip was a patron of the arts, and he was very fond of chess. And therefore, he did support Rui Lopez, and a lot of you will know Rui Lopez, of course, because of the opening that's named after him. And Rui Lopez, uh, he only lived 50 years, but that was probably quite a long time in those days. Um, but in, when he was 30, he writes his book uh, called uh, The Art of Chess, because he visited Italy and he'd, uh, he'd beaten all the Italian players. And uh, he'd seen Damiano's book. Uh, Damiano actually was not an Italian, he was a Portuguese. And... So there's quite a lot of credentials for Spain being the main centre of chess at that time. These things are disputed. Was it France? Was it Italy? Was it Spain? So 
Rui Lopez apparently didn't think much of Damiano, so he decided to write his own book, possibly refuting uh, Damiano. And um, we'll just look into that book. The book has now been translated. I've got it. It cost me 25 quid. Uh, well, it didn't. Somebody bought it for me. That's very nice of them. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's an amazing book. And Rui Lopez, I believe, is an amazing teacher. We can, we can learn so much for him. Um, so, and it's very, very unusual what he actually suggests. We think, we know him as the author of Luis Lopez, but let's look at the first uh, chapter of his book and see what opening he actually does advocate. Uh, so here, uh, here we have the book from which we have the photo, uh, sorry, the picture, which I have enlarged for your um, for your interest, and so th the first half of the book is a, a very long uh, discussion of, of the rules of chess. Uh, don't forget he has a, chess was kind of linked to society, so he, he is actually describing chess on, in terms of society, not in the way we describe it as just a game. This is a way of um, describing how society should be organized, and therefore what position do you put the king in? What honor do you give to King Philip II? You know, this wonderful patron. So how can you big up Philip II and show he's important when obviously the strongest piece on the board is the queen? And uh, we don't want queens and women uh, getting too powerful, do we now, uh, guys? Uh, but that's another subject. To, um, I don't want to um, upset anyone at the moment. So, so Rui Lopez has to kind of tread this narrow path when he's describing the game. But when he gets to the actual chess game and his descriptions, then it's very interesting how he begins. So he begins by saying, White will begin moving the king pawn to the extent that it moves. So I think we can work out that that is he plays, he's suggesting e4. And then he says, if black were to play the king pawn to the extent that it moves, which means, see, this is the modern chess they're playing, and then we, we get a move which is not mentioned in the opening books uh, of today. Uh, you won't find it in the opening books. He plays c3. So, Milo Pesis is already thinking about the center control by the pawns. Whereas now we often begin more with, we bung a pawn in the center, but then we get out, we get out the knights and bishops and castle. Uh, so c3 is Rui Lopez's suggestion. Then he says, if black were to play the king's knight to the bishop's third square. So it's all written down. It's all written down. Every move is written down in longhand. And I think that's great. I think all chess books should be written like that. Because uh, it's it's an absolute menace when you open a page of a modern chess book and you've got about 50 or 60 moves written down. All those moves are coming at you. No, you need time to think about those moves. So it would be much better if they wrote all the books in the way that Rui Lopez has done, but they've actually helpfully put an algebraic translation of the move, so in case I don't understand. And that gives you time to look at each move carefully. So black plays the king's knight to f6, obviously firing at the white pawn, in order to capture the opposing king's pawn. And then, what do you think Rui Lopez's next move is? A little has anyone suggested what Rui Lopez is going to play next? Um, uh, e. <laughs> what's happened? Uh, where, what's happened? <laughs> where is it? So somebody suggesting after knight c6, d3, we can transpose into a Philidor reverse. Very good. So, yes, and uh, yep, so other people are threatening, uh, suggesting d3. Very interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, why it's got several moves here. I wonder if Queen A4 is any good, a kind of accelerated Ponziani. Because at least Queen A4 would stop Black playing D5 to attack the, 
the white e pawn. Now, uh, Ria Lopez isn't quite so extreme. He says white would move the queen to her bishop's second square. So already with Ria Lopez's first lesson, we're in a completely unknown opening. But it, it makes a lot of sense because nowadays uh, the Philidor is, is, is gaining a, a kind of renaissance. Uh, as people, uh, and even when they play the Gyoko piano nowadays, they used to play the Gyoko piano by, if you know what the Gyoko piano is, but uh, you're bringing out your knights and bishops, and then you're playing C3 and D4. But nowadays they, they start with the Gyoko piano, and, and then they play the pawn to D3. So these restrained ways of playing the opening um, are coming back in favor. So kind of the wheel is going full circle and we can start to appreciate the insights of Re Lopez that this, this book he wrote, I would say it's probably the third chess book ever written for modern chess. First is Lucina, then you have Damiano, and now you have this blockbuster from Re Lopez, which I haven't read thoroughly, but it's, it's, it's certainly interesting. So black now goes bishop to c5 and in this chapter Re Lopez is suggesting knight f3 and then black he he, he suggests knight c6 now guarding the pawn at e5 now Re Lopez clearly cannot play d4 because his pawn is not sufficiently defended so he, he plays his bishop to b5. So what we've got is this uh, delayed Re Lopez. As I read more of this book, uh, and there's a lot of it, I'll see if Re Lopez actually does talk about his own opening. Or was it uh, put on him later on by uh, punters? Uh, he does, does spend a lot of time uh, talking about Damiano's book and try and presumably prove it wrong. So bishop b5, kind of a delayed Re Lopez, and now black plays d6. That surprises us a bit, but don't forget, uh, I, well, don't forget what I will tell you later. Uh, so I, you, you, can't, you can't forget it because you don't know what I've said. I'll only say what I'm going to say later. So black plays d6. So this gives Re Lopez the opportunity to play his pawn up to d4. So you might kind of think, oh, this is a fix by Re Lopez trying to get a position <laughs> which he wants to prove he's got his uh, he's got his pawn center. Uh, but there's something else going on here. So we got the exchange of pawns. And then black bishop, black's in trouble. He's got to play bishop checks. And at this point, white can block. And he say, um, now white has sort of got some threats of at some point playing d5, attacking the pin knight. So black will play, Mila Pez says, bishop d7 to um that's what he says, uh, if black were to move the queen's bishop to the queen's second square, that's bishop d7, in order to remove the knight from covering the king. So we would nowadays say he's trying to break the pin. Now let's look at um, Re Lopez's next move. Uh, we're, all, we're wondering why haven't they castled? Well, like I explained in previous uh, lectures, the, the castling rules weren't sorted. The, the, the new move of the queen, the new move of the bishop, the new move of the pawn, all those have been worked out. But they spent a couple of hundred years arguing about how you should castle. And uh, we'll look at that in more detail. So Re Lopez's next move is not to castle. It's to play his rook to f1. Because as I say, they, they were still disputing about what was the best way to castle. Um, he says, and he says, white would move the king's rook to the bishop's square to transpose it. Um, maybe there's something lost in translation, but I think he's, what he's saying is, 
that after you played rook to f1, on a subsequent move, you'd be able to make the king's leap to g1, say. You could be able to, uh, uh, then you kind of do castling in two moves. To, so the game was still a little bit slower than what we have today, where you castle in one move. And then, and this is the wonderful piece about Guy Lopez's book, his expression. In this way, White, knowing how to play, will arrange his game very well. He has the game arranged better, and his pieces will attack the enemy more effectively. So that kind of uh, aside, White, knowing how to play. What he means is, uh, if you're a rabbit, even if you've got this wonderful position, you'll still mess it up. But what he means by knowing how to play, you have a certain competence in chess. So he quite often ends his chapters with saying, you know, you've got an advantage if you know how to play. Hmm? So Ri Lopez was quite well aware of the capacities of his, of his students. So we may return to this book, but I think we can find from this book an enormous treasure house of teaching, a totally original way of looking at things. Now we'll go on to the playing of chess. <laughs> Nope. <laughs> I know something vaguely. I think it's maybe it's a way of sacrificing some pieces in the opening. I'll have to look that up. <laughs> in Gambits Accepted by L. Elliot Fletcher, which was called the worst chess book ever written. But uh, in my opinion, it was a great book. Okay, we have an opponent here. Um, so he's played uh, the you know the well-known blunder c4. Uh, we know that that loses by force, but I probably won't be able to demonstrate it in this game because, as Rui Lopez says, uh, Black has a one position if he knows how to play, and I'm not sure if I know how to play, <coughs> but I do know I have a one position. Right, so shall we hit the center? Accentuate the positive, the power of the diagonal, the bishop's diagonal. I don't think he'll take that pawn. Yeah, they usually do block. Uh, now, I think we'll play this. And about centralizing the knight. He has uh, something of an outpost at his disposal on e5. White can drive the knight away, but then he might expose himself in the center. I mean, I'm tempted to take the knight on c3. Uh, whew, what do we do now? Okay, this is this is a bit risky. <clears throat> Possibly won't try it again if it doesn't work. What I'm trying to do is to solidify my knight a little better on the center square. Yeah? Because if he attacks me with his pawn, I can take him on the passant. Right, queen b3, yep, okay, uh, no, we're not sure what to do, but we have to make decisions, what about, okay, we play rook to b8, Ooh, that was a mistake, <laughs> Could have won a pawn and lost his queen. I know he's castling. Okay. Uh, will he still lose his queen if he wins a pawn? Yeah. Okay, let's play the pawn up to h5. Maybe start some kind of avalanche on his king. F3. Yeah. OK. 
Okay. We're going to take or not. Okay, let's take. Oops. Take. Hmm. Taking the tonight. Uh, let's. Ooh, I forgot about that. But now. Play H4. Well, I can. Um, okay, let's let's play H4. I would say, do not try this at home. Not sure if H4 is the correct move. This is all looking very risky again. Okay. We'll try this one, the knight going to g4. <coughs> this is my problem, I'm kind of impatient, so I'm just overreaching in a good position. I sacrificed a pawn, now I'm threatening bishop d4 check and a bit of a cheapo here. Thinking. <laughs> He's probably going to move his knight back to f3, which uh, looks, a, looks like a good shot to me. But. Oh. What's happening? Oh, he's still thinking. <laughs> 94. Yeah, that's a good reply. Because he wants to bring his queen into the defense. Yeah. Ah, so, question of what do we play f5? Which is looking extremely risky. Uh, yeah, let's play f5. But then I can't get my bishop into that. Uh, should I play knight f6? Then he might go crazy. I'm not too worried there. Okay, so let's try. What about a developing move? Knight f6. I chose that instead of playing f5. He'll take queen a4 check and win my pawn at a7 and lose his queen. Why doesn't he do that? Because <laughs> he's not an idiot. Queen f3. Yeah. Now if I take the knight, he could take on f7. Why should I take that risk? Could I move my knight back? Take the knight is a bit too risky. I think I'll have to play. Knight to e5. So he's got to put his queen somewhere now. No, he took, no, he didn't. He took with check. I'll take back with check. Hmm. Now he's got to put his queen somewhere. He's got to guard his c pawn. Queen e4. Good move. Alright. Now we're a bit stuck. Uh, could we go bishop takes knight and then rook g8? Maybe. Um, not sure about this. Uh, gosh. Uh, right, I think we want to get our king out of the way. Let's play the king to 
D7. Maybe they'll try and sort of castle him in the Relopez fashion, because we haven't actually got proper castling rules yet. Going back into the 16th century. H3 check, not quite me. Ah, have I got a square? Yes. King to C7. Okay. Mm -hmm. Taking that, I think I should take the Queen to try and get her along onto the white squares. They would be one. Should we play Queen to H3? Trying to get some kind of attack going. Right, I guess he'll probably play queen to g2. Would I play rook takes knight? Might try that. Could be a possible attack. He'll play queen g2. Don't want to exchange queens. My rook. I don't think I've got a mate. But I got a good attack. Would that work? Rook takes bishop. Right. Oh, surprised with that. But uh, check on a song good. I don't know why he did that. Hmm. Still think he should go queen g2. No, he's played b4. Right. Uh, how strong is his attack? Getting quite strong. I think I'm going to play my rook. Whoops. Rook across. Come on. Yeah. So I'm threatening rook takes knight or queen takes knight. Knight and doing stuff to him. takes the pawn. I'll probably play rook takes knight and that's threatening me. Yeah. He takes check, I move the king back to b8. Don't think he's got any more moves coming. So no king h1 allows queen f1 mate. That would be a good plan. Bishop f4, rook takes knight. Still, he looks like he's in pressure. Okay, I'm still going to take this geezer here. I've been told not to swear. Maybe this geezer swear word. Right. King. Right. We've castled, sort of. <laughs> right. Now, his pawns are powerful. But his king is not. What can we do? 
still got to play that move queen g2 um yes he has done that i think we'll just try and mop up he does have lots of fast pawn and now we maybe get this one here so i think we'll look ahead it should be enough to win the game despite his mighty pawns before well this guy is so generous he's given me another piece okay now has he got any more pieces to give away just the rook on b1 what can he do to get rid of that no <laughs> decided to throw in the towel okay so we did prove that c4 lost by force in that game sure there'll be people to dispute my opinion have we got another opponent so this is more difficult as well why because black hasn't committed himself yeah so have we got an no opponent one. we're white this time nodal or oh, a strong player two one six nine uh whew. Let's try um, Anderson's opening with the world champion of 1851. A3, so D5. Okay, we should, we can play E3. This is going to reverse St. George. Okay, he's going, going full tilt. So we'll, we'll do a full St. George. And he's playing knight f6. So we have a St. George with a move in hand. Doesn't always work. Bishop to dolly 6. Okay. So put pressure on that pawn. <sighs> so we can't castle and bring his rook to e8. He has to defend his pawn in another way, uh, which can give us a chance. Right. Very positions. Very complex. A6. Yes, great move. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna put some pressure on his center and see how he responds. So I'm threatening to kind of win a pawn at d5. Uh, I guess he can just give up the center, which he probably will now. Yes, this is a crunch moment. Yes, he's, he's decided, I think, correctly to uh, to go up the center. And he's castled. And now he's going to go B5. And that's the problem, how to keep the momentum of the position. Knight d4 doesn't. He's clearly going to put some pressure on the position by going pawn to c5 and b5. Now, what do we want to do? Good question. Probably got to think about sacrificing a pawn here. Uh, 
Okay. Da. Probably play Queen E7 here. Yep. No. This is an unclear variation, as you can see. B5, excellent move. And can we get away with Bishop D3? I think we can just about. Played h6. Right, that's a big question for us. I think we'll leave the knight there. Maybe play the queen back to c2. So he may take the knight, but then his king might uh, might suffer as a result. So we're trying to play on these um, center squares, e4 and f5. I don't think he'll take the knight, but he might. I don't think he no, he hasn't taken the knight. Bishop b7 is, I think, a good answer. Um, now he's going to try and get in c5, which would be a strong move. Should we play knight h7? I don't, I'm not sure if that's the right choice. Uh, play bishop h7 check, but we don't Not. Uh, of course. Yeah, knight e4, is that going to work? Knight e4, pawn takes knight, pawn takes knight. Looks okay for me. Bishop takes. Hmm, okay, I better make some decision here. Play knight e4. Now, he might still be tempted to take my knight. I don't think he will. He takes the knight when I take the pawn. Could do. Born C5. Okay. Yeah, fine, fine defense that. No. Okay, let's take some. Could be okay. Okay, should we go? See what the best is here. Play knight takes knight. Mm -hmm. Play knight takes knight. Uh huh. Play what takes four. Mm 
Right. I think he's he's doing quite well here. Can we play? No, we can't do that. Try knight e4, knight takes knight, bishop takes. Uh, what's what I've got? Just four minutes left. I'm not really sure what I'm going to do here. Knight draw seven, rook c8, knight e4. That's not so good, rook c8 also. Are quite a good thing, so he's going to get in rook c8, which I don't like. Uh. Yeah, nope, this isn't going well. So, I make a choice here. Mm -hmm. because uh, my queen's going to be exposed on c2. Uh, yes, it looks like it's going to end in tears. So, we <laughs> uh, right. Well, we'll have to retreat. Oh, he did it that way. That's also very strong. Yep. Uh, well, <laughs> can I do anything? Maybe just swap and put the. Okay, let's swap. Okay, see if we can rely. Right, oh, 152. Right, so this might be a good position. <clears throat> Queen c7. What's that for? Okay. We're going to we're gonna bow to the inevitable. Get Queen C7. It's not being made, but I think I can stop that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Two. Can I swap? A bit of swappage. They're threatening. Well, we might have threatened something now. Okay, I'm not sure if we played this right because it's better than it was. Uh, he has got a plan. Okay, 
right? Good shot. He's got Larry Fisher. Oops. Uh, I think we should see two. That might be okay. Let's try that. We should go back to C2. Yeah. If he takes the pawn, I can play rook to D1. Should be okay. I should get his e pawn. Now, at the moment, it could be worse. Now we've got to play bishop d5, but we really want to swap, swap the queens because the end game should be better for us because we have more pawns in the center. Play queen e6. Um, now we maybe play. Whoops, we haven't got much time. Uh, that's a good move by him. Okay, we're going to play the. Let's try and get our rook into action. Right. Oh, we only got 41 seconds. <laughs> this is not looking good. Um, okay, we're going to play the queen. C5. I think we're threatening to win a pawn by e4. Or queen c7 might be a threat. D4 might be a threat. Play right there. Um, what's I going to do? Play E4. See if that can win a pawn. If it doesn't, then it might get the queens off. Okay, now we try. Come on. <laughs> It takes so long to move these pieces. Bags of the time. Okay. Right. If he wins, born, he's in trouble. Still only 17 seconds. Not very. Um, oh, come on. <laughs> okay. Oh. <laughs> it's taking 700 years to move the pieces. Okay. Uh, oh, oh, made a mistake. So that loses. Oh, I lost some time. Okay, well played. <laughs> <laughs> yep, win final position. It's okay, but uh, he should have got the advantage in the middle game uh, because I think he made a slight mistake and I regained, but I spent too long in trying to get out of the position. Well, that's great. Okay, so I hope you'll all join the Invisible Army. Go to Mike uh, to contact us on MikeBasmanChess.com. Great. Okay, thanks a lot.